Take your Bibles and join me in Mark 11. Mark 11. Well, the time is later than normal. The message will be more brief than normal. Uh, and so I invite you to quickly find your place there in Mark 11. We're going to be concluding Mark 11 as a chapter today. Today is also, I'm excited to say this, today is the 50th message in the Gospel of Mark for us. Uh, I love uh, being able to say that. I'm excited uh, for this. I don't know how many we got left, but we're going to keep going. And uh, Mark 11, 27 to 33, as we follow the final moments of Jesus' earthly life. Today, uh, a message here. I'm a terrible title giver for a message, so I just call this the authority of the king. I don't know what else to call it. So uh, the authority of the king, the title for today. Look with me at Mark 11, verse 27. I'll read all the way through the end of the chapter in verse 33. And they come, to, come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there came to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and saying to him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask of you one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say, from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say, of men, they feared the people. For all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. This is the word of God. Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, let our thoughts today be of you. Let our impulses be to worship you. Let our words be to glorify your name. And let our response be to kneel in humble prayer. And this is all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago, a friend of mine was coming in town uh, to finalize a book deal that he had written with Moody Publishers, and his meeting was mid-morning of the day that he was coming in on the campus of Moody Bible Institute and Moody Publishers, and he was flying in from the East Coast early in the morning, and he asked if I could pick him up and uh, drive him to the appointment, and I was able to, to and I was willing, and uh, he was basically in the city for a day driving, uh, so he didn't want to rent a car. He thought, well, if I can just get to my appointment, I'll figure everything else out from there, and so uh, but he told me, he said, when I'm free with my, when I'm done with my appointment at Moody Publishers, I'm free to, uh, to do anything that you'd like to do if you have any desire to. And I thought, well, I don't really want to spend time with you. I'm just kidding. I didn't think that. Um, and so I said, yeah, of course. I said, let me kind of just uh, spin around some ideas about what was going on. And, and uh, in just kind of co casual conversation, I had asked him, I said, have you ever been to Wrigley Field? And he said, no. And I thought, well, uh, I would be a terrible friend if I didn't take my friends to Wrigley Field. That's the way I uh, see uh, my role in life. And so uh, I um, reached out to some people that I know that had access to tickets, and uh, I um, scooped up a couple of tickets that I had to go, I had to pick up. So I had to uh, pick them up at O'Hare. I had to drive him to Moody. Then I had to drive uh, downtown and pick up the tickets for my friend. And so when I pulled up to where my friend was, he gave me the tickets. They were in an envelope. And I just thanked him and drove off, going back to Moody to, to get ready to pick my friend up. And I uh, was, uh, when, I, when I got up to, to the campus there at Moody Bible Institute, I pulled in the parking lot and I opened the tickets because in my mind I was like, I, I wonder where we're sitting. Like, um, you know, these tickets in this situation are usually pretty good. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a nosebleed kind of a guy because my bank account tells me I have to be. And so... I opened the, t the envelope, which was sealed, and there were four tickets in there. There were two tickets for the seats, and there were two tickets for what's called the 1914 Club. Now, if you know nothing about the 1914 Club, you one, you have to be sitting in some of the best seats in the ballpark, and two, the 1914 Club is an all-you-can-eat, all-you-can-drink beverage kind of a place. When I say all-you-can-eat, I mean not hot dogs, but chicken parm and stuff like that. I mean, it's incredible. So I was thinking in my head, like, how in the world did I land these? And so my friend gets in the car. I said, you're not going to believe this, man. We're not just going to Wrigley. 
we're, we're, we're going to be ballers today at Wrigley. Like, we're sitting in legit seats, and we have unlimited food. And he was like, man, I'm just going to go to games with you all the time then. And so we got to the ball. By the way, with that came free parking, so we got into the, we, I mean, I just felt like I had arrived. I, it was like, you know, what planet I'm on. So we park, we walk down the street, we go into Wrigley, we go to our seats, we're sitting there, we're looking up at the people in the nosebleeds, we're thinking, you guys are peasants up there. Like, look at us down here. So we, go, we take our tickets and we go down to the 1914 club. I, I, I won't explain all how to get there and do all that because probably none of you are ever going to go either. But um, we get there and I, I have my tickets. And so there's an usher that was standing at the door. You're not just walking into the club. You, you're, you've got to show proof that you belong in the club. By the way, if you try to buy 1914 tickets on StubHub, they're usually north of at least $350. And so... I, you know, acted like I belonged. I, I told my kids, fake it till you make it kind of a role, you know, like, like, yeah, I belong here. Here's my ticket. Let me buy, you know. And the guy gives me a bracelet. I put the bracelet on. It says 1914 Club. And he said, you don't need your ticket anymore. Every time you come during the game, just, just show the bracelet. And so I was like, like, this is like VIP world. And so, I mean, we, we went back to our seats. We, the guy behind me was like, where'd you get that food? I was like, bro, like, you don't belong with us, right? Like, um, we had like, a, I mean, we're talking about a plate. It looked like Thanksgiving dinner on my plate at a ballpark. But when we went in there, we went in there, and, and just for some privacy on this for the people, we also learned that we had access to a, a private room where we could eat and watch the game on a television. We walked into the room, and there was a, a young man sitting there with a couple friends, and he looked at us, and he's like, who are you? And we explained, I explained the situation. And he said, well, then obviously you belong here because you, he knew my friend and that was kind of the circumstance there. And I, I said, I said uh, to him, I said, if, if, if you're not comfortable with being in here at any point, that's fine, we won't. He said, nope. He said, you have full authority to be in this room whenever you want. And if somebody asks you, you tell him, he gave his name, you tell them that I said you can be here. The story that's in front of us is a story about why Jesus has authority to do what he's doing. In essence, the temple, in the temple there on that day, they, the religious leaders came to him and they asked Jesus, do you have a ticket to be here? Do you have a... Wristband, by what authority are you here? The theme of authority is central to Mark's gospel. On one hand, Jesus is portrayed as a suffering servant. On another hand, he is portrayed as a, the king. And so as a servant, you ask, what authority does a servant have? In those days, none. Jesus depicts, Mark depicts him also as a king, the one who serves his people through suffering, and what authority? Authority does a king have? All authority. In fact, Mark's gospel has been showing this from the very beginning. When his first public appearance in the synagogue at Capernaum, Jesus showed that he had authority both over the Torah, the scribes, and the demonic world. In Mark 20, Mark 1, 22, they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority. In verse 27 of that same passage, when he casts out a demon, for with authority, Mark said, commandeth he even the unclean spirits, they do obey him. So he taught with authority, he casted out demons with authority. So the authority of Jesus is a foundation of his ministry. It's even more evidenced by him making claims throughout his ministry that claims that only belong to God. In chapter 2 of Mark, he claims authority to forgive sins. He claims supremacy over the Sabbath and the Torah. In chapter 3, he states the authority as God to bind Satan, referred to in Mark 3 as the strong man. And in chapter 11, he says that he has the authority to be the new temple where God and man can meet, replacing and fulfilling the work of the temple. Many times throughout Jesus' teaching, the Scriptures note language like Jesus saying, verily, verily, or what I'm telling you is true. This kind of authority of teaching 
belongs only to one who is God and has the authority. John's Gospel, John's Gospel notes in John chapter 5, verse 26, Jesus saying, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. He is the Messiah. He has authority. And we know, we know that this authority matters, don't we? It's the authority of his teaching that shows us that the Word of God is divine truth. It's the authority of His miracles that shows us that Jesus has divine power. It's the authority of His suffering and resurrection that shows us divine forgiveness and salvation. Without the authority of Jesus, we should all pack our bags and go home and never come back. At the heart of all that we know and believe about the person and work of Jesus is His authority. Is it any wonder for us that after studying Mark's gospel now for 49 messages, months and months and months of working through texts, is it any wonder to to us that the religious leaders of Jesus' day struggled fundamentally with his authority? Religious people are always going to struggle with the authority of Jesus. Those who don't want to submit to Jesus to his rule, will have a problem with the authority of Christ. We understand that even in our own brokenness, that our tendency to to revolt against authority or to rebel against authority or to diminish authority or even, yes, to abuse authority is a problem in our sinful world. But Jesus is not an authority, the authority who mistreats those who come to him. Jesus definitely is not one that we should ever rebel against. So as we consider this text today, I, I want you to see it just in uh, two movements and then one final, one final portion. I'm going to move rather quickly here. Number one, we see the very, very beginning, verses 27 and 28, the questioning of Jesus' authority. Questioning Jesus' authority. It appears that at this point, it's probably Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus and his disciples have come back to Jerusalem. They enter into the temple grounds. And here come the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, according to verse 27. Now, these three groups, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, comprised what we know as the Jewish Sanhedrin. Quite literally, Sanhedrin meaning council. More than likely in this situation, the Sanhedrin, which was made up of 71 rabbis, probably all 71 don't approach Jesus, so it might be a delegation from the Sanhedrin. So these chief priests, scribes, elders, this cel- this delegation from the Sanhedrin comes to Jesus. And by the way, about the Sanhedrin, the the intent of this was an aim for the Jewish people to follow what God had commanded in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, when God said to them after, before they go into the promised land, when they're in the wilderness, he he tells them, judges and officers, shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. And so the Sanhedrin was in, uh, in essence, it was a, a, a creation that was attempting to follow the command of God. And at this time of Jewish history, the Sanhedrin served as a buffer between Rome and Caesar and the Jewish people. These men had complete freedom in religious matters but they had restricted freedom in political matters. And in Mark's gospel, Mark only shows the Sanhedrin approaching Jesus in this instance, and then we're going to see the Sanhedrin again at Jesus' trial before his crucifixion. But this group clearly has some authority. They have authority in and around the temple, and so they, they approach Jesus as he's walking in the temple, and they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, as we read this, because we're separated from the previous passage in our study today, we should ask, what 
or these things, right? And so we can assume by the context that they're talking about Jesus and his cleansing moment of Mark eleven fifteen to 19. Who gives you the authority to come in here and to turn over tables, to tell people to stop carrying stuff through here? Who tells you to get the animals out of here? Who tells you to, that you have the authority to do that? Everything Jesus had done in that cleansing moment was a direct, was a direct affront to the Sanhedrin themselves because they led and ruled over the temple. And so the question that's asked, by what authority are you given, or what, what authority are you doing these things? Now, the question here is not about what Jesus had done. They didn't ask him why he cleansed the temple. They asked him, on what authority did you do this? Who gave you this right? And so, what authority do you have? And where did you get it? That's the line of questioning for Jesus. The implied position of the Jewish leaders here is that nobody has this authority. We have it. The implied position here is that it only comes from God. And so, if Jesus attributes his authority to God, it would then lead to a charge of blasphemy. And so, while they're Concerned about the authority issue, they're also pressing him because if he claims that he has authority from God, then he's blaspheming God. And according to the Mishnah, it would lead to capital punishment. So we have to wonder in this moment is Jesus going to make that bold claim? Is he going to say, Well, I am God, the authority is mine, I, I let you do what you've done? But this is mine to reclaim. Now, the second part of this is Jesus questioning their understanding about authority. I want you to notice what Jesus does there in Mark eleven twenty nine, 29. And Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask of you one question and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. So they asked Jesus a question, and Jesus, instead of answering their question directly, does something that was very normal in rabbinic traditions in this time. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to make sure I help the parents out here and remind the children and teenagers, you don't get to do this with your parents when they ask you a question, all right? right. just want to be like Jesus, Dad, so I'm going to ask you a question to your question. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But this is a very normal rabbinic tradition. So Jesus answers the question by another question, which we've already seen happen in Mark's gospel a couple times, in Mark 10 and verse 2. In Mark 1, verses 9 through 11. Well, while Jesus is not trying to be evasive, what does John's baptizing work have to do with Jesus, his authority? And, and Mark 1 tells us, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Let me help us understand for a moment, I believe the reason for this question. In John's baptism of Jesus, the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and the Father empowered Christ for his ministry in that moment, enduing him with the authority, the authority from heaven. So to answer the question, Jesus says that what you decide about John is what you will decide about Jesus. What you decide about John is what you'll decide about Jesus. Was all of this conferred by man, or was it conferred by the God of heaven? Was John's baptism explained in mere human dimensions, or is it something, is it something that is only, only understood in heavenly dimensions? If, I mean, if Jesus is baptized by John, and in that baptism, God, God grants Jesus authority, then we have to consider the importance of John's baptizing moment here. Verse 31 says, and they 
reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did ye not believe him? But if ye shall say of men, they feared the people, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And so their discussion in this moment, verse 31, they reasoned with themselves. The discussion is an outcome-based discussion. They reason, if they say that John's baptism will be from heaven, then Jesus will question why the religious leaders didn't believe John. But if the baptism of John was not of heaven, but of men, then the people will turn against them because John was viewed as a prophet. And so the language here, the language here used to describe John is that he's a prophet. He is here for a specific purpose. And the religious leaders didn't want to put their seal of approval on the now dead prophet. And by the way, John had come at them pretty hard in his ministry. Matthew 3 and verse 7 all the way through verse 10 shows us that when John's seeing the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not fruit, not uh, not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. John's rebuke to the to the Jewish leadership was God doesn't need you. (laughs) And Jesus as well had offered had already announced the greatness of John in light of his prophetic role in the purpose of God. And we see that in Luke 7, 28. Now, this is all simple groundwork for this. And Jesus said, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. For he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of God. Notice that. Being, they, they justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. They had already told the people what they believed about John by not being baptized. They themselves rejected the counsel of God. Now, the Sanhedrin, the council, refused to admit that John was that prophet. They refused to. Luke 20, in this story, in Luke's gospel, he says, Mark, excuse me, Luke notes, but if we say, but and if we say, of all men, all the people will stone us. This is the, 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 the Sanhedrin speaking. All the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. So these men are afraid that if they don't confess that John's baptism was from heaven, that the people would then turn on them. And Luke notes, that they're afraid that the people will stone them. What these men ultimately do is shuffle between unbelief, skepticism, and cowardice. Afraid of the people. Too prideful to admit that Jesus is who he said he was. And so what happens is the situation concludes in silence. Look at verse 33. And the answer is said to Jesus, we cannot tell. We cannot tell is akin to saying, we're... We're keeping an open mind. (laughs) Kind of a political answer, if you will, to which Jesus says, then you don't deserve an answer about my authority. Because if you can't look at all that I've done and look at John as being a, a, a prophet from God, if you can't confess that, then you don't deserve an answer about my authority. As simple as that may be, if you question my authority after my teaching in the synagogue with power and authority after healing somebody with, with, with demons, with infirmities, raising those that, are, that were dead. If you don't believe in my authority you, and, and you want to you wanna act like you're not willing to confess, you don't deserve an answer. The proof of Jesus being God was overwhelming through his miracles, through his healings. They didn't want to submit to Jesus. That's the bottom line. They didn't want to submit to Jesus after all. And because of that, on these religious leaders, the light has gone out. Let me give you a couple things in conclusion today. First off, I think it's important that we all understand that the Sanhedrin 
are a case study, say it like that, in religious cowardice. For if you cannot be honest with yourself, how in the world would you ever be honest about Jesus? In fact, this is the greatest hindrance. The greatest hindrance to admitting that Jesus has the authority to forgive your sins. For instance, the hindrance is not that we don't know that we're sinners because everybody knows that they've done wrong. We all carry pain and shame over sin. The problem is our, is our lack of willingness to admit that Jesus has been given authority by God to forgive all sin through His death on the cross. And so, Jesus in His authority is either an affront to our view of ourselves, our autonomy, our pride. We don't want to submit to Jesus because of our pride, because of our desire for, to be autonomous, to not feel subjected to Jesus. Or secondly, we don't want the authority of Christ because we can't understand how this is possible. And by the way, interestingly, we can't understand how it's possible. Therefore, the arbitrator and the determiner of all that is true becomes our understanding. And how foolish is that? Because at the end of the day, the cowardice of the Sanhedrin is ultimately connected to pride. Pride. These men are just too prideful to confess that Jesus is God. And the reality is, come to the authority of Christ, to come to Jesus, it takes humility. And it absolutely takes the courage to admit my sin, the courage to admit my need for a Savior, and to place my faith in Christ. So the Sanhedrin gives us a view of what it means. By the way, why would anybody want to follow these men spiritually? They're unwilling to make a determination on mere crowd-pleasing. This is Judaism in this day. The question of the Sanhedrin matters actually significantly, though. Who gave you this authority? In fact, they help us to understand something vital about the person and work of Christ. And that is if Jesus does not have the authority of God, that nothing he does matters. We can't neglect that reality. Their question is for us. For if Jesus does not have authority, why should we take anything seriously? Why does it matter? Why does it matter even now? Well, before Jesus ascended to heaven 40 days after the resurrection, he reminded the apostles that all power, all authority was given to him in heaven and in earth. The power that has been given is the same Greek word used in Mark 11 to describe authority. It's the Greek word exousia. It means authority. And so when Jesus says in Matthew 28, the classic famous Great Commission passage, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus is saying, this is a power that comes with authority. I'm giving you my power. You now are being given my authority. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is the power and the authority of Christ. And truthfully, we have to understand that Jesus delegated, hear me very carefully, his very unique authority to the apostles. He gave it to the apostles as the foundation of the church. Unique aspects of this authority were shared with the apostles in signs and wonders and miraculous work. You and I did not get every aspect of that unique authority that ended with the apostles but what all believers did get is the opportunity to share in this authority in one very specific way. And that is the proclamation of the Word of God. 
For in the word of God is the authority of God. You and I have not been given the authority of the apostles. We are not the foundation of the church. You and I have not been granted every aspect of signs and wonders and miraculous work. But you and I have been granted the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority to preach and teach and share God's very word. The authority that you and I have today is the authority to open up God's word and to say, this is what God said. This is not what I said. This is not what my pastor said. This is not what YouTube pastor said. This is what God said. And the authority of the church, the authority of Christians, that Jesus has given us has been to grant us the privilege to proclaim God's word. Now let me say, Unlike the Sanhedrin, you and I in 2024 cannot be cowardly with this task. We cannot be afraid to say, this is what God's Word said. I don't understand everything that you want to argue about, but this is what God's Word said. I don't understand every nuance to everything you say, but this is what God's Word said. And this is the only authority I have to determine what is true is based off God's Word. And so we can't be afraid to say, I believe this because the Word of God said so. You and I today, because of God's Spirit, we can be bold. We can be bold like Christ. There is a need for us. There is a need for Christians to look at the authority of Christ, to find strength, an example, to lean on the power of the Spirit, and to be bold with the Word. Moms and dads, husbands and wives in our home, let's be very bold with God's Word. This is what God's Word said. This is why our family does what we do. This is why our church does what they do. This is why I hold the position I hold. This is why, because God's Word said so. That's the authority. And by the way, any other outside authority is only so because of God. By the way, just to be clear about this, because we're in an election season, even government is an authority granted by God. They are not the ultimate. Thank God, by the way. So we find strength. We lean on the Word and we proclaim the Word. To ask about Jesus' authority is one thing for the Sanhedrin. The problem was not really with their grasp of authority, but with their submission to it. I'm not speaking today necessarily on the authority of a parent or a boss or that kind of authority. I'm speaking today of the one with ultimate authority. I don't know about you. Uh, I don't know your personality. I don't know how you handle being told what to do. But I think for the entirety of my life, I have wrestled with immediate obedience. I'm number four child of six. I am the classic middle child with older brothers, younger sisters. I was going to do what I wanted to do. To this day, I still don't like to be told to go 35 and a 35. And if you're going 34 and a 35, I will let you know you are. The truth is in our flesh, hear me, in our flesh, and even the sinfulness of our own heart, to be told that God is our ultimate authority rubs against the grain for us. To be told that God's Word is the ultimate authority in our life makes us a little bit uncomfortable at times. To be told that Christ is Lord and we are not is an affront to all that I've been told to think of myself. But this passage, while about authority, is ultimately about submission. My greatest struggle in my life was not submitting to my mom and dad. My greatest struggle in my life is not submitting to a, to a sign on the road. My greatest submission struggle in my life is my submission to Jesus. Yet, my submission to Jesus 
is the greatest decision I make in my life. And I have to make it day in and day out. I have to read God's Word, and I'm like, what do I do with this? What does this say? What should I believe about this? And the question of submission to Christ is at the heart of that. And that submission starts with receiving Jesus as Savior. If Christ can forgive my sins, but not command my marriage, then I should really check my view of Jesus. If Christ can forgive my sins, but not speak to sexuality, then I should consider my view. If Christ can forgive my sins, but it should not affect the way I think of work, then I should check my view of Jesus. If if Christ can forgive my sins, but not command my money, then I should check my view of Jesus. See, all of this comes down to if he's the authority over sins, and he is the authority over everything else. The question becomes, will I respond in submission to the authority of Jesus? Jesus is unique, though. I finish with this. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. This is no hyperbole. I went to that Cub game that day. And by the way, the Cubs won, which is all that really matters. The Cubs won. And I, you know what I did? I thought, this. you might think I'm petty, and you pray for me over this. I thought everybody in this ballpark thinks I'm special because I'm going to the 1914 club. I, I Look, I mean, I've got the wristband. I belong there. I just am validated. Hear me. I am validated by my authority to go in. You know what validates all of us? Jesus is Lord. It's not our authority in life in any way. It is that Christ has full authority, and because he does, we can now find the ultimate validation that we need is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Because Jesus has full authority in heaven and in earth. We submit to him, we proclaim his word until he comes. Let's pray.